Marvin Goldfried is a distinguished professor of psychology at Stony Brook University, where he helped develop the graduate program in clinical psychology. He's the co-founder of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. Alan Francis is a professor of psychiatry and chair emeritus at Duke and was chair of the DSM-4 task force. Marvin describes the evolution of his psychotherapy orientation as psychodynamic, behavioral, CBT, and eventually integrative. He practices, teaches, and supervises what works clinically using direct and indirect evidence base. Alan describes his approach to psychotherapy as whatever works or no one size fits all. He was trained and taught at the Columbia University Psychoanalytic Center, but remains equally interested in brief, supportive, cognitive, behavioral, interpersonal, and family therapies. Please enjoy this week's episode. We know each other for, was it like 40 years or more than 40 years under, I don't know if you remember, you wrote a promotion for the book by Jerry Davison and I, Clinical Behavior Therapy, in 1976. You probably don't remember it, but you said a nice thing. So it's, it's in, it was in the blurb. Anyway, um, so we've been talking back and forth. We've been tweeting and we've been doing a lot of therapy, therapy research, therapy writing, teaching, supervision, and so on. And we figured that it would be nice to talk about some topics, some of which get dealt with a lot in the literature, but we can give our point of view on it. But, but some of them are not discussed very much at all. And what we decided to do is, and you, I'll give the ball to you. What did we decide to do? Well, I think that we're going to have a kind of casual presentation of very important topics. So we're going to try to pick out the things that people want to hear and then go back and forth on what we think about them. And I, I think audiences often prefer to hear conversations than lectures. So we're hoping that we'll engage people and get to them to thinking about the same topics that interest us. Yeah. And you had a good idea about how to start today, right? Well, I think that people should understand that psychotherapy is a very broad canvas. Yeah. And each of our, each of our little chats is going to try to take one tiny box of that canvas and highlight it. And today we thought we would discuss the topic of is psychotherapy like every other human relationship or is it really quite different? I, I have the very broadest definition of psychotherapy. I'm not sure Marvin will agree with me, but I think psychotherapy started originally with a shaman tens of thousands of years ago in hunting and gathering tribes. He was the first psychotherapist. He was a spirit healer who used his knowledge of, of the supernatural world and his knowledge of people's psychology to heal, heal people. That psychotherapy goes to the ancient Greek philosophers, the, the Stoics and the Epicureans, who very much influenced Tim Beck and, and Albert Ellis in, in developing cognitive behavior therapies. It goes to Christian philosophy and Christian practice, ritual practice, like the confession. Uh, the Arab psychiatrists a thousand years ago were, were practicing psychotherapy with their patients. You're not saying that it's the same, that, they, that we're doing the same thing that they're doing? I'm saying that what we're doing is not qualitatively different than what's been done over the ages quantitatively different in several ways that I, I'll mention in a minute. But I think that basically psychotherapy is a human endeavor. It, it, it's tens of thousands of years old, and it's happening currently every day in many, many human relationships. And it has specialized features, but if it weren't basically like other human relationships, it wouldn't be nearly so effective. Uh -huh. so, so it's a go-to person when you got problems or you got issues somebody who's looked up to somebody who's respected yeah I, th I think psychotherapy is different quantitatively than most relationships in, in four ways one that there's a magical aura around healing relationships and especially that's true in psychotherapy are you saying it's it's different from other relationships but it's similar to the shaman it's similar to the shaman, shaman. okay and, yeah and part of the part of why psychotherapy works is that we have the shaman's magic. I uh -huh. think the second thing is we have techniques, specialized techniques, and you're the world's expert on that. And I wanna hear a lot more from you on the techniques. I think the third thing that's different is that it's one of the most intimate relationships in the world, much more intimate than most 
relationships in, in, in everyday life. And finally, I think it's a very asymmetrical relationship in terms of self-disclosure. So that <laughs> therapists disclose some, but compared to most things, it's a one-way street with maybe 95% of the disclosure being on the part of, of the patient. So I think those four things are different, but the, the context around those four things is a human relationship. Yeah. Well, uh, as you remember, Perry London and his wonderful uh, insights uh, uh, in his book, uh, Modes and Morals of Therapy, he said that therapists are the, are the secular priests. So it's very much uh, consistent with what, what you're talking to. But, so I've been thinking a lot about that and I'm thinking a lot about Jerome Frank and, uh, and how he has really picked up on this and, and said that what therapy does or what the therapist does is it takes the person who's demoralized and moralizes that person, gives them a sense of hope. And I've always thought, yeah. you know, that's great. But is that, is that an, I don't think that's enough. I mean, it's a promissory note. And it can make people feel better. And they can feel better when they feel they're talking to somebody who's an expert, who's listening, who's caring, and things like that. Uh, and um, Roger said it was both necessary and sufficient. But I think he had a narrower view of what psychotherapy is and what its function was. So I think there needs to be more than that. But, you know, that maybe that's a topic for, uh, uh, for, for, for another podcast. Well, it's interesting. So I have a much broader definition of psychotherapy than you do. Well, what is it? So, so my definition of psychotherapy would include the whole range of human relationships that have a healing element to them, um, often not even conscious, but uh, implicit. And your definition of psychotherapy would be more the, the technical procedure of a professional doing psychotherapy with a patient or client. Oh, but no, I, I do believe that the relationship is crucial. Uh, and I, I believe that for many, many years. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you're saying that psychotherapy occurs in all relationships, because that's a very tricky kind of thing, because that says, well, you know, why bother to go through a therapist, to a therapist who, um, why, uh, and pay them? Why bother to get all that training if it's the same thing as, as ordinary discussions? Well, that, that's really the crux of it. I, I, I think that why bother go to a therapist would come a professional therapist under the special auspices of psychotherapy. Why bother? Because the psychotherapy of everyday life hasn't worked. The support from relatives, the support from teachers and mentors, the support from bosses, the support from self-help books hasn't worked. And that doesn't mean that that wasn't psychotherapy. It just means it was psychotherapy that wasn't targeted enough and done in an expert enough way to work. Yeah. But I, I would see psychotherapy as being a very special, intense kind of human relationship devoted to, to, to healing of, of psychological problems, but not radically different from all these other relationships. Okay. okay. Often right. I, I do think it's different. Uh, and I know it's different because I've trained and supervised student therapists, and it takes them a long time before they become effective. So it's clearly not the same. Uh, something more is needed. And, and maybe we should focus a bit more precisely on what more is needed within a psychotherapy relationship. Okay? Well, this is really great because it, it, we're, even though we thought maybe all these years we agree on most things, yeah, and we do agree on most things, it's great that at the very beginning we're finding a really, a real difference between us. I have the exact opposite experience training people, I think. So some of the very best psychotherapists I've ever known, I've met and thought they were the best after their first session. I think that really terrific psychotherapists are born and not made. I think training uh -huh. helps good therapists become better therapists, good natural therapists, with training become much better than they would be okay. naturally. No, I, I agree. There are some people who are naturals. Uh, I think some people who are not naturals can be trained. And maybe training is a, is a good topic for some future podcast for us to, to uh, dialogue on. Um, but I do think that there are certain qualities that make for a good therapist 
but but the per therapist still needs training depending upon the nature of the problem so you can be really empathic and a wonderful warm person but if a, if your patient is having panic attacks or compulsive rituals or they have sleep problems or they have problems with work habits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or if they can't function because they're in a deep depression, you need more than just tender love and care. So I don't think we disagree on that. I, th I think that it's, it's a matter, again, quantitative versus qualitative. So I think we would both agree qualitatively that it's crucial for psychotherapists to be good at forming relationships, inspiring hope, giving a sense of comfort and empathy. And that that relationship itself is is very healing in and of itself. We would both agree that technique adds, especially for specific symptom problems, adds a great deal to the general uh, background context of yeah. a good relationship. Right, and I would go. I would say techniques, but also the nature of the influence of the interaction. That a therapist can be warm and and intimate and have all these great qualities, but they need to know something. They need to know when a person is ready perhaps to hear a suggestion and when a person is not ready to hear a suggestion. So that, I, I don't know if we can call that technique and call it timing. Um, I think one of our problems that we have, you and I, and it's a problem that everybody I think has in discussing psychotherapy is that we discuss it with words. And words mean different things. I'm not quite sure I know what you mean by qualitative and quantitative. So, I mean, that's a barrier. I'm not quite sure what you mean by intimacy. But if you were to show me a video clip of something, I'd say, yes, okay, I know what that is. Whatever we call it. Both but of us have seen many of the great therapists in action, yeah. either in person or on tape. One of the things that's astounding is how similar they are. Yes, at least the good ones. <laughs> some of the, there's some crazy ones that, I mean, Albert Ellis was a little bit off on, uh, in his intervention by uh, yelling at people and things like that. But, it, but I think I know what you're talking about. So let me give an example, because I think that'll tell us whether we're on the same page. Many of us are fortunate to have very close friends who we consider soulmates where we can tell them things and they will accept it. We can tell them things that are perhaps secrets that we're not too proud of, and they will accept it and say they understand empathically. That's a quality of a good therapist. So a good therapist in, first, in session one is a person that listens, that understands, that connects. But therapists, need to know more to do therapy than simply being a soulmate. Mar Marvin, I think, it, I don't believe one size ever fits all. Right. That for, for many patients, that in itself is the healing element. Yes. And techniques, techniques may not be particularly relevant. For other patients, the techniques are much more important and, and will determine the success of the therapy and being a, 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 a nice person, empathic person, being able to understand problems will not be enough. Well, so I think yeah, one of the things I, about I, that we should start out saying and agree on is there will never be a statement about psychotherapy that encompasses all situations right. because the particulars are going to always be so particular. Now, I think we're in total agreement on that. And I think that's a crucial point. And let me give you an illustration of why I think it's crucial. For many years, Hans Strupp and I had a, an argument and he was saying, what there is to therapy, it's a set, the essential thing is the relationship, is the relationship. And I think he said that because psychoanalytic therapy, and you're a scholar on that, moved from the Freudian drive to the nature of the relationship. And that became the big change, I think, an improvement for psychodynamic therapy. It's the relationship that deals with things. Finally, I, he came, Hans finally came around. I said, Hans, if somebody comes to therapy who's disorganized and needs work skills or, or, um, or, or learning skills, is it just the relationship? And he said, no. 
So the question then becomes, what are the needs of the patient? What is the problem of the patient? And for certain kinds of things, being able to talk things out, being able to get another perspective is crucial. Yeah, you know, Strep's own experiments in the 60s were very illustrative at this point, that he had college professors go up against trained therapists with college students. Yes. And the comparison was striking to some that the college professors with no, absolutely no training in psychotherapy did as well as the highly trained uh, therapists in, 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 at Vanderbilt. The, the hidden thing in that experiment is that college professors would be absolutely expert at college students and the problems of college students. Exactly. But they probably would do so much better with college students than with any other group of patients. And they had an inbuilt edge over the therapists and being in their own environment. Yeah. I think this goes to what you're saying, that the relationship in certain situations will be all important. In other situations, the technique be, will be most or all important. Exactly. And in most therapies, it's a combination of the two. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, there are some CBT therapists, particularly in my experience of beginning CBT therapists, that would disagree. Where they would say, the re and I've, I've seen this happen, and much to my chagrin, uh, where they said the relationship is unimportant, that it's all the technique. And I think this comes from a history uh, within behavior therapy of referring to the therapy relationship as the, quote, nonspecifics whatever that meant. And what, it, what I think it mean, meant at the time was we believe that behavior therapy involves a relearning, either through classical or operant conditioning. And yes, it's good to have a therapist who's understanding, but that's not specific to the change process. The f good therapist just facilitates the relearning process by doing something that we don't specify because it's not learning. And I think that is deeply ingrained in the minds of some beginning CBT therapists. But it's certainly not what the experienced CBT therapists are teaching. So Judy Beck or Tim Beck, who just died a couple of weeks ago, just the opposite. No. That they were very much involved with the, the, the use of the relationship and empathy. I think the other point I'd make in what you're saying, it's really interesting. That one concept that ties together relationship and technique is corrective emotional experience. For years, the psychodynamic therapist would say that the change occurs within the session. CBT people would say the change occurs between sessions. The psychodynamic people are saying the nature of the interaction provides a corrective experience where the, where the patient is allowed to say things and doesn't get criticized. And that provides the corrective experience. The CBT person would say it's exposure where the person between sessions does things that they haven't done before that they're afraid of. Um, and then nothing bad happens and their life becomes better. Well, the corrective experience ties these two together, except one occurs within the session and the other occurs between sessions. So I think a lot of CBT people don't recognize the power of exposure, if, if, I, if, if I use that terminology, uh, or the change process within the session. Uh, let me give a prime example. And this has occurred again and again supervising CBT therapists with socially anxious patients. They're following the manual, which says they've got to do exposures with people between sessions. The, ther the beginning therapists say, I'm having trouble with this patient. What's the problem? I can't get this person to elaborate the kinds of situations. I can't get them to do the work and tell me things in session. They remain silent a lot. And then the aha experience that I tried to give them is, you know why? Because they're socially anxious. And you have the problem right in front of you. And you're complaining about it, but it's a blessing in disguise. The, for the most part, these are not in the manual. 
So and, and that's another topic to, for discussion. I think this goes exactly to what your, your life's career has been about. And that is that anyone who's applying the extreme of any form of therapy yeah. may do fine with a very narrow group of patients, but won't do fine with most other types. And that we really need to be integrating therapy. There should be one psychotherapy. We, we shouldn't be saying, oh, the CBT therapist does that, the analytic therapist. It really should be that every therapist is comfortable with the different schools of thought and can apply them flexibly to the needs yep. of that particular patient. Here's the thing. Key thing. Um, good therapists don't argue with their patients. You can be in a close relationship and love somebody and they can be your soulmate, but you will argue with them from time to time. Ther good therapists don't do this. So the therapy script is different in that regard. They have to understand why the person is doing something. They have to understand why the patient is not changing. They have to understand why the patient is angry at them rather than getting angry back. That is a script that is very hard to learn. And this is something, I mean, we wrote a book on this. Several of us edited a book. Um, Abe Wolf, uh, Chris Moran and I edited a book, the title being uh, Transforming Negative Reactions to Clients from Frustration to Compassion where we had chapters from people from different orientations to see what the similarity is. What do you do when you get angry at a patient, when they're frustrated? And we came up with a synthesis. And that is the first thing you've got to recognize that you are angry at the patient. And you may not recognize that. You may recognize, well, I'm a little bit frustrated. Or, gee, I don't look forward to this session. Or I keep looking at the clock. So it's a subliminal annoyance and you've got to recognize that and use it as a cue. And then it becomes a question, what is the person doing that's getting me annoyed? Well, this person's not doing the homework. This person is resistant. And why is that getting me annoyed? Well, I'm working so hard. I prepare for my sessions. I've got lots of other things to do. The subliminal Labeling is a misattribution of the motive of why the patient is not changing and, and being a good patient. They're just being a good human being. And maybe we haven't come up with the right approach for dealing with this person. So we need to see what's going on with this person. Looking below the, quote, the surface of the behavior that's resistant. And this person came to therapy because their life is not working. The one and only life that they have is not working and they came to you for help. So you need to keep your eye on the ball and that is compassion. And you need to remain compassionate for a, ther for a patient who may be a pain in the butt. That's, a good, that's good therapy. It's also one way that psychotherapy is different than most human relationships. Exactly. It calls a lot more patience and compassion than most relationships do. That's right. That's right. Sid Blatt once said, I am at my best as a human being when I'm doing therapy. Very, very interesting. Marvin, I, we have to stop now, but how about if we make that the theme of our next, uh, our next chat? What, what, the theme of what? How Which, about if we make that comment, I'm at my best as a therapist when I'm in therapy. Why don't we make that the theme of our next chat? What does that mean? And how do we get Let's there? Talk, yeah, how, how do we get people to, to, be, to, to be at their best as therapists? What kind of people will be at their best of therapists? And how does that kind of therapist deal with the difficult problems that patients bring, bring to us? Yeah. And how does training fit into this? How does training how do fit into That sounds good. I've got some thoughts. You've got some thoughts on that. Um, you've had some experience with that, professionally, personally. 
This is good. I, I think uh, I think this could be the beginning of a wonderful relationship. Okay. <laughs> well, our, our wonderful relationship start, started more than four, four no, we're years we're supposed ago. to put we're supposed to put on raincoats and walk toward the plane at this point. <laughs> I'm delighted that we get to continue it in this way. I hope this it's is, it's fun for the people listening as it has been for me. Yeah, same here. Stay safe. See you next time. <laughs>